Hi, I'm Jessica Silby, Professor of Law at Northeastern University School of Law. And this is our third annual conference for the Center of Law Innovation and Creativity. It has um, been our tradition to have a keynote speaker who is not a lawyer, but speaks about things that are interesting and important to law as um, the inestimable um, Ann Nelson will do today. Um, and I just wanna say to um, welcome, first of all, thank you for joining us. And um, after her keynote at 1245, there will be a short screening of a, um, of a seven minute video. That'll be the subject of the last panel of the day um, on art law and democracy, uh, art and democracy. Um, that will be in Zoom room B. So the, the video is called in the event of moon landing. And as I've said before, some people think it's a deep fake, other people think it's art. Um, anyway, we'll be talking all about that. Um, and it's relevant to Anne's uh, comments today about truth and disinformation in the internet age. So welcome everybody for being here. Uh, thank you for being here. Uh, Tony. Thank you, Jessica. Um, and so it's my pleasure to introduce Anne Nelson. Anne Nelson is an author and a lecturer in the fields of international affairs, media, and human rights. As a journalist, she covered the conflicts in El Salvador, Guatemala, and won the Livingston Award for Best International Reporting from the Philippines. She served as the director of the Committee to Protect Journalists and in 1995 became the director uh, of the international program at the Columbia School of Journalism where she created the first curriculum in human rights reporting. You are going to hear a lot about Anne's most recent work, Shadow Network, where she talks about um, not only politics and democracy, but the uses of uh, technology and data and micro-targeting um, and its impact on our uh, democratic structures uh, in the past and, and the implications for the future. Welcome, Anne. Thanks so much, Tony. It's a real pleasure to be with you all. And I really uh, enjoyed the last panel. It raised a lot of questions for me. Um, so I hope for the chance to have a live in-person exchange with you all at a future date. Um, as Tony mentioned, a lot of my interest in this field comes from my professional background. I was the fifth staff member to be hired at Human Rights Watch back in the day. So I worked very closely with lawyers looking at lots of these issues in a previous technological age uh, where we were looking at freedom of expression, at freedom of the press, et cetera. And then I was at the Columbia Graduate School of Journalism in the period where we moved from the traditional news media into the digital age with a lot of bumps that we haven't yet resolved. And in fact, I think that we're dealing with a lot of crises in both our political and our cultural spheres um, and the legal framework that, that underlies them because there wasn't enough thought at the time about the architecture that was being formed around us. Uh, there was a kind of laissez-faire attitude that it would take care of itself. And I remember a, a certain period of euphoria where people were talking about citizen journalists and how they would take the place of traditional journalists without understanding what, what excellent journalists actually did. And I kept wondering, you know, would, how would you like to go to a citizen dentist for your root canal? Um, so, what, what I'd like to talk about today is also rooted in my own background. I grew up in Oklahoma. I've lived in New York City for my entire adult life, but I've gone back and forth between the two cultures. And I think part of our national crisis that we're living through very acutely this month has to do with a regional divide that's been a long time in the making. And it is intrinsically connected, not only to our media environment and the transition to the digital age, but also to the speed at which different populations adapt to new technologies and new forms of, edu of, of information. So in that interest, I'm going to whip through some slides that will lay out some of the research that I've been carrying out over the last three years on this subject. So, do that now. And so, looking at the political framework right now, it is extremely important to remember that Clinton won the popular vote by nearly 3 million votes in 2016. 
Trump won the Electoral College by 100,000 votes less in three states, Pennsylvania, Wisconsin, and Michigan. So we have this kind of geographic uh, inequality built into our Constitution, and it's certainly going to be there in two and a half weeks when we have the election. What I'm seeing in terms of pollsters is that Biden could win the election by as many as 10 percentage points and still have that hair thin margin that could lose him the Electoral College. And so the information systems that these different voters work under is a critical part of not just our culture, but our future and how our future is decided. So the other part of our national divide is the urban versus rural voters. Here you look at the blue areas which vote Democrat and the vast sea of red, which is a population that as we know from, from our political coverage, often feels that it's been left behind. Uh, a lot of these areas are people who live in rural areas, they live in small towns, sometimes in suburbs. The suburbs start to turn pale pink or pale blue as transitional areas, but we've also got a population that is not only uh, physically isolated from the urban areas, but they're also isolated in terms of a lot of educational and informational uh, systems. So now looking at the elections that are coming up, there are six swing states that will decide our future. And if you look at it in terms of climate, uh, I would say that they're going to determine a lot of the future of the world. Uh, so looking at these informational systems and how to improve them and harmonize them is of urgent importance. My specialty is looking at media systems. So what's new? Well, negative advertising is not new. You have negative political cartoons and imagery going all the way back to the invention of newspapers uh, in, in the 17th and 18th century. Also, the coverage of information that is tailored for a specific audience is not new. When Lincoln gives the Gettysburg Address, he tailors his remarks to veterans and families of fallen soldiers. And so it's going to be a set of remarks that, that is designed to appeal to that particular audience. However, you start at his period in history to have journalists who are going to record those remarks and then put them in the context of a newspaper and share them with a broader public. So we had this period that was more or less 100 years where we had the development of a professional news media system. And if you look at the pyramid that involved what I perceived as a, a young person in Oklahoma in the 1960s and 70s, and what my college classmates perceived in New York and Los Angeles, we had a lot of the same basis of information, starting with the Associated Press and the other wire services, going to the prestigious newspapers, news magazines. The networks basically read from the same page of story priority and the facts as they were reported. And then you had the trickle down to the local newspapers, the local radio, radio stations, who would read from these news reports. So, for example, you had very contentious debates over the war in Vietnam in the 1960s and 70s. But you had general agreement about what had happened. There was a battle. Uh, the battle was at such a location with such a number of casualties, and that could be disputed, but, but the general idea was in agreement. What we have now is a big departure from that, where one area of the news audience is saying, we're debating health policies about pre-existing conditions, and the other side is looking at QAnon conspiracy theories about pedophilia. So we've got these two silos that have developed over time. A lot of people don't see the full meaning of what professional journalism does. And that what's important in this context is that you are, you are seeing reporters and, and the on-camera anchor person and so on 
But beneath that, and beneath everything that is reported, or most of the content, is this whole underlying structure of the iceberg, which really challenges the reporters and what's visible to be as accurate as possible. There are fact checkers, there are lawyers, uh, there are layers and layers of editors who are involved. There is a coterie and a professional discipline, which is uh, something that, that, that journalists hold very sacred if, if they're quality professional journalists. And of course, that's not everyone, but it is still generally practiced in the profession in many areas. And it's important and it's what distinguishes professional journalism from other uh, more random information that appears on people's social media feeds, but they don't really understand how it works a lot of the time. So a good reporter works from multiple sources. They're really trying to think as though they're a prosecutor and a defense lawyer at the same time. And to look at the adversary's view and be open enough in terms of their thinking to accept it. And so there's a constant testing of the truth. And that can culminate in changing your mind about the story after you started reporting it. You thought it was X, you're convinced that it's Y by the evidence. And in that way, it tracks the scientific method, it tracks a lot of other disciplines. And of course, in journalism, it's even more uh, uh, compelling because a good journalist will run a correction when they've been in error, and that's deeply humiliating. So what's happened to our national journalism environment? Well, it's been a disaster. You had several economic uh, downturns, but you also had the, the technological revolution that has siphoned off most of the ad revenues from the newspapers that have provided most of our local reporting in many states. There are several thousand counties in the United States that don't have a single newspaper. And so you have these communities where they see news, if at all, coming in from the outside, the East Coast, the West Coast, but they don't see any reflection of the communities for themselves in the news that they're getting. Uh, and this has really caused part of our, our, our national crisis. Uh, another area of it that is very concerning is that the State House reporters core has declined by over a third. So that means that when you have state level legislation going on, and that's where a lot of our important legislation goes on in terms of environmental regulations, in terms of social matters and tax policies, that core of reporters has been reduced massively. And what's really tragic is that a lot of those and a lot of that attrition has been the most experienced people who have the sources, who have the knowledge, and they've just lost their jobs. And that means that their communities have lost their services. You'll see something similar replicated in town hall meetings on a local level. So that means that you've got these new populations of what are called low information voters. Now, what could go wrong? Well, nature of poor is a vacuum. And you leave a vacuum that can be filled by bad foreign actors, starting with Russia. You also have a vacuum in information that other interests have filled. Some of these are religious. And a number of fundamentalist organizations, fundamentalist Christians, have rushed in to fill this vacuum with, with pseudo news operations, where they have somebody who's called an anchor man who sits behind a desk and they have tyrants. And they read from a script that sounds like news language. But it's one-sided, it's marketing language, it's highly partisan political, and it has the opposite effect of professional journalism because it is selling a particular partisan position as opposed to challenging the, and interrogating the reality around the viewers. The other part of these systems, and there is a powerful economic interest as well that invests hundreds of millions of dollars in these information systems that try to erode the architecture of knowledge as we've known it, fact-based journalism, science, public education, and measures like the fairness doctrine that promote concepts of fairness and accuracy in the public sphere. So what does it look like? Well, we've got two nations. One is largely coastal and urban, and it still looks at news content 
that comes from traditional sources. Uh, you've had a boom in subscriptions for our major newspapers, the New York Times, the Washington Post, the Wall Street Journal, and the people who uh, are, are, are the audience for those uh, organizations are well informed from their perspective, but I will say as a native Oklahoman that their perspective and their focus tends to be on the East Coast. That's where they're based, that's where a lot of their reporters are from. Uh, and there's often an attitude that if they're going to cover anything in between New York and Los Angeles, they treat it as what they call flyover country. Uh, you go and you report on tornadoes and, and uh, school shootings. But in terms of the everyday life and in terms of people's daily concerns, um, they're not by, by definition going to be as well represented there as they would be from local institutions. So again, filling that vacuum, you've got a new information system that has taken shape over the last 20 years, by and large, 20 to 30 years. And that has tied back into some of the regulatory changes that were discussed in the last panel. You've got conservative talk radio, which has taken over much of the radio landscape in the middle of the country. Cable television networks, include, including Fox, but also the problematic environment where you have Fox pushing its, its perspective and MSNBC pushing an opposite one. It tends to undermine people's confidence in the possibility of, of factual uh, reporting that is not highly rooted in, in opinion reporting. Then you've got the Sinclair local stations, which are tied into this conservative media landscape you have fundamentalist broadcasters and lots of partners who are in digital and social media platforms. And the thing is that a lot of these news organizations are not even visible to people on, on the coast. Uh, I came across this entire thesis simply because I was visiting my family in Oklahoma and started listening to the radio in the car and wondering who these, these broadcasters were and who was funding them and then seeing their effect grow over the last five to 10 years to have a national impact. Now, many of these outlets are run by people who are members of something called the Council for National Policy. And I hope you'll keep that in mind. Uh, if you were paying attention to the Washington Post a couple of days ago, they released some videos from the Council for National Policy where they linked their media strategies to their political strategies in helping to bring Donald Trump to power and keep him there. And it's a secretive organization that has been engaged in this process for 40 years. So for example, my colleagues at Columbia and, and those in, in the New York Times and the Washington Post have often told me that they've never even heard of the Salem Media Group. It's one of the key organizations in the Council for National Policy. Uh, both of its founders are prominent members. And you see that they've got national coverage, 3,100 affiliate radio stations nationwide. They've tied as being the fifth largest radio operation in the country. But you look here at, at, their, uh, at their website and they've got book publishing. And if you look at a lot of the conservative ultra right-wing books that make the bestseller list, you'll see that they're from Regnery Publishing, which is a subsidiary of Salem. And Beyond that, in recent years, they've developed a whole panoply of online uh, platforms. And so what you have is an information system that takes a kind of directive from a centralized uh, base and redistributes it across their media platforms. So you not only get it on the Salem radio stations, you get it on Christian broadcasting, you get it on their Town Hall, Hot Air, Red State, PJ Media, and other systems. And often it is done in exactly the same language. It's uncanny. Uh, they will make the argument, they'll, they'll deluge these states in the middle of the country with this information. And I want to say something here about this, this convergence of media and technology. I observe that a lot of people that I've worked with are very uh, enamored of the most advanced technology, which makes sense from a commercial point of view and marketing. 
But if you're looking at recruiting voters in swing states, you have a very high degree of voter turnout among older white voters. And let me tell you, these voters like retro, okay? So these are people who drive in cars with the radio on. And my friends in New York, especially my young ones, say, well, everyone listens to podcasts. Well, no. Uh, you have rural voters in Missouri driving around with their cars and their radios on who are deeply affected by these media. And they also have their Facebook information funnels. And so they are surrounded by this information and they may not even have access to a local newspaper. Uh, the audiences for network news, ABC, NBC, and CBS has plummeted over the last 20 years. So that's another vanished source. So you've got them as a really captive audience for these information systems. So here we have one in five US adults who say the social media is their primary source of political news. And again, rule out the coastal areas and the big cities, and you get a lot of swing voters in battleground states. What's the problem with that? Well, they have lower political knowledge than people who get their news elsewhere. And they're going to be voting based on the information they get, not from the information that we think that they ought to get. So here they are just waiting to be engaged by political forces. And I will say, for example, that the Democratic Party has utterly ignored radio as, as a way of reaching these audiences. You had Air America, which lasted for about five minutes and then folded. Whereas you have this massive effort to build out these thousands of right-wing and fundamentalist radio stations and to link them to digital campaign tools and to forms of social media. So this goes back to 2008 uh, in terms of utilizing data. Obama was very successful in working with Catalyst network data for environmentalists and other traditional partners for the Democratic Party. And the, the fundamentalists were deeply chagrined by his victory in 2008. Uh, they abhorred his social values, they abhorred his racial identity and many other aspects of his presidency. And at this point, they also won an ally in the Koch brothers. The Koch brothers were upset because there were environmental regulations and tax policies that were detrimental to their business interests. So you started to find a, a, a working relationship between these two. Um, so looking forward from 2008 to 2016, these groups work together to identify the battleground states, find the persuadable voters. If they were in churches, it was using fundamentalist churches and their strong social ties, uh, going back to Granovetter, right? And using them to create peer pressure among pastors and other congregants, tying that into the media and finding messaging that could engage them and then cover it with various layers of media persuasion to in convince the persuadable voters to go vote if they were going to vote for Republicans and to suppress the votes of people who lean Democratic. So they did identify a hundred as some 18 million unengaged fundamentalist voters and they found that in terms of their own parallel George Lakoff moment, that their most effective argument was abortion. And the way they did this was to, to generally falsify the abortion debate. What they said was that Hillary Clinton and Democrats in general are in favor of a term that they invented, which is partial birth abortion. And actually their strategists were very proud of themselves because they, they said, that they found, they invented a term that was so visual and so visceral that it convinced people that what this was about was taking babies who were on you know, full-term babies and willy-nilly executing them. And that's the terminology that they use. So you can go back to recordings of speeches by Ted Cruz and more recently by Donald Trump, and you'll find them talking about abortion on demand up to the day of birth. 
quote unquote. And that is very carefully chosen language because it's first of all outrageous and second of all, it, it doesn't exist. Uh, that, is, that is not existent in the United States and I don't know if it exists anywhere, but it is what they play. And not only do they sell this language on their radio shows and on their, on their memes in social media, but they also create videos with animations of this process as imagined, and they screened it in church sanctuaries and distribute it throughout these communities. So that's one of the ways that they reach their audience. And they have created this vast uh, number of, of voter guides. This is the one, uh, you probably remember Judge Roy Moore in Alabama, who had some issues with the age of the women that he liked to date. Um, so this was handed out in church sanctuaries and inserted in church bulletins. And it's called the voter guide. So it doesn't, so, so these are tax exempt organizations. So they're legally nonpartisan, right? So they don't officially endorse one candidate or another. It's just that if you're in Alabama, you look at it and you see that Roy Moore does not support the homosexual agenda and his Democratic opponent does support the homosexual agenda. Now, I don't know what the homosexual agenda is, but apparently for their audiences, it is an issue. And of course, at the top of the list is conservative judges, as we've seen this week. So these tactics were highly effective. And in 2016, they substantially raised the number of conservative Christian voters who participated in the election. And I guess it was 81% who voted for Trump. And that was enough to help push him over in these swing states uh, and create the surprise that the, a lot of the journalists uh, and the national analysts experienced <clears throat> four years ago in November. The Koch brothers data platform has been an essential part of this uh, strategy. Uh, it, they re also responded to the 2008 election of, of Obama. And for the reasons that I mentioned, they felt that they needed to take measures to, to get their economic policies back into power in Washington. So they invested $50 million, five zero million million in a data platform that was state of the art. Um, and it, it, it really did combine with the Council for National Policies, fundamentalists and other swing state rural approaches and media. Uh, and what it did was create a database working with Cambridge Analytica that basically covered some, I mean, I think at this point it's 2000 data points for every, every voter in America. It, um, so what was new about it was that it combined consumer data and, and political data. And then it combined with the Council for National Policies organizations to harvest church directories. So you can come, you, so you say, all right, let's look at the Pentecostal church in Springfield, Missouri. We can find out from the church roster who, who, are, who are the members of the church. We compare them with the political data files. So what did they vote in the last three elections? We can combine that. Then we go to their Netflix uh, viewing habits and their Amazon purchases, and we combine this to get a profile. And then we categorize every voter according to uh, a few dozen categories. The data, the categories are, are kind of interesting. There's the elderly couch potato, there's the crunchy granola millennial and so on. Um, and then what they did was combine this data, make it available to the organizations and the candidates that they supported and then merge it with the apps. So when their canvassers went door to door, they would find out who was going to be behind that door, how they voted and uh, what the pitch should be. And the young canvassers, usually young, would have a pitch that would be pre-written to them, tailored, personally tailored to the voter. So let's say, again, we're in Springfield, Missouri, 
and you know that the lady that's answering the door is the Catholic mother of six who watches anti-abortion films on Netflix. And you know that the script that's going to appeal to her is going to be tailored to that issue. Whereas the guy next door is, is a hunter who's terrified that he's going to lose his gun. So you give him an NRA pitch, right? And those are provided to you on your cell phone. Um, they also are hey, pioneering this use of downloading the directories with, with kind of passive permissions on the app so that the person who downloads their app basically gives them access to their entire cell phone directories to use for political purposes. Now, in 2020, Brad Parscall created a new generation of the app, and that has relied a great deal on geolocation functions. So they access the app at rallies, and they even build beacons into the yard signs. So they have done that and then combine it with the consumer data. And now these voters are just getting bombarded with all kinds of peer pressure over the next few weeks. So that is one of the reasons why Trump has been so keen on holding mass rallies in person throughout the COVID crisis, right? They invested a lot in this app, but the app really depended on having the true believers show up the rallies, downloading the app, and then, then leveraging their enthusiasm and their contact. So they have different ways of positioning issues, as I mentioned before. And one thing that's important is to, when you look at the messaging of both information silos, which I have quite a lot, uh, you're getting a very different approach. So the Democrats are relying on the news media to tell their story. The Republicans are, are trying to undermine the news media, call it fake news, et cetera, and create an atmosphere of threat and violence and distrust above all, distrust of institutions, distrust of science, distrust of knowledge, um, and, and have this persecuted adversarial idea of modern society. So does everybody use data micro-targeting and apps? Yes, there's a really good piece in the MIT Technology Review that was at, came out a couple of weeks ago. And it talks about the way micro-targeting especially is being used in, in both presidential campaigns. Um, one difference that has been an obstacle for the Democrats recently is that the I360 managed to aggregate data and make it available across state lines for different campaigns, to centralize it. And the Democrats had set up a different structure with Catalyst and made it a for-profit company and less shareable, uh, rather purchasable by local candidates. So that created an uneven playing field uh, really for the last four years. And it was only about two weeks ago that the, the Democratic National Committee announced that they were going to be uh, pooling data and making the same data available to different campaigns. But it was very late in the day for them to get to that point because the Republicans had been in that space for four or five years. Is it the same? Uh, no, Republican groups have been using data to suppress voting and they've also used it, utilized mental health data, which is a possible HIPAA violation. And I'll be talking a bit more about that. Also, when I talked about the geolocation functions and the passive access to directories, um, the Biden app is, has, is set up differently. It's more transparent than the Trump 2020 app, and it doesn't, hasn't been using geolocation. There is a documentary that goes into the use of the mental health data, it's called People You May Know, it's currently on Amazon Prime. So let's see how information plays out in these two information systems. Uh, the way that they cover Black Lives Matter, this is pretty much what you're going to hear on Fundamentalist Radio and see on their, on their uh, social media. It's stressing violence, it's stressing social conflict, um, it's, it's stressing alarm. It is trying to, to engage voters through fear. And you'll see, again, 
the, the imagery, the language repeated across their platforms. There's also a very intentional uh, effort to alienate African American voters and to uh, dissuade them from voting for Democrats. So this is a meme that, that they've been promoting and many, many others like it about Kamala Harris. I want to talk for a brief moment about a case study that I've, I've recently documented, uh, the hydroxychloroquine fraud. Um, this was something that was planned on a phone call that was leaked by the Trump campaign and the Council for National Policy Leadership. And they said that they understood they needed to reopen the economy despite COVID for the purposes of the Trump campaign. And so they conferred and decided that doctors would have credibility. They recruited a group of doctors who were going to make the argument that hydroxychloroquine was a cure for COVID. Many of them were not even emergency physicians. There was a child psychiatrist, there was an ophthalmologist, people who had no professional qualifications for dealing with emergency medicine. But they held a press conference in Washington and Trump tweeted it and it was live streamed by Breitbart and then picked up and filtered across these media platforms. So here you see uh, the Council of National Policy member, Charlie Kirk, who hosts Simone Gold, who is the doctor who led the America's Frontline Doctors project. And what they're doing, again, is undermining Dr. Fauci, creating great distrust for the CDC, a medical deep state, as they call it, and promoting the idea that nobody needs to worry about uh, losing their mask, going out in public, because hydroxychloroquine is not only a cure, they also maintained it was a prophylactic from COVID. And that had already been established by any number of serious studies that it was just not true. But they're promoting it at a time when we're getting ready for a big second wave of cases in different parts of the country. Well, then you remember from my earlier slide, Red State, which is part of the Salem media empire. Red State puts out its defense of Simone Gold. You remember PJ Media from the Salem media empire. They put out support for Simone Gold. They put it out in their uh, media sphere. You have uh, a whole campaign that says that uh, Simone Gold is being persecuted by big, big tech and that some how uh, there's a conspiracy to withhold the cure for COVID from the American public. That is reported on Fox News. So it goes wide on broadcast. And of course, it's also distributed not only on Breitbart, but this comes from Christian Broadcasting News, right? So this is a fundamentalist broadcasting service and it goes out to fundamentalists who are again Many of these, I mean, I'm sorry, it, it, it disturbs me because many of the viewers of the Christian Broadcasting Network are elderly people who are very susceptible to COVID and they live in states that are spiking at the moment. And this is not right. So uh, beyond the hydroxychloroquine fraud, you have active efforts to, suppro to suppress the African-American vote. Um, Channel 4 in England just uh, released uh, an investigation a couple of weeks ago that was how Cambridge Analytica data used in this complex was used to persuade African American voters in Wisconsin not to vote for Hillary. And they interviewed people and what, what one of the people who's done the a really important research on this is Shereen Mitchell. And she found that what these voters were told was to go and vote, but not to vote for president at all, just vote down the ticket. And she found that there were 90,000 African-American voters in, Wisconsin, in Michigan who left the presidential vote blank. Uh, one of the things that was very interesting to me is that a lot of these voters were located on Instagram as a very popular platform among that population. So it's, it's been quite sophisticated and again, 
uh, Michigan was lost in 2016 by the tiniest of margins. Uh, I also mentioned that documentary, People You May Know, and it shows how these organizations harvest mental health data among mentally ill and vulnerable populations, and then use them to use the data to pull them into church functions and church groups where they're then deployed for political purposes. So what can we do? Uh, I promised Tony Morgan that I would <laughs> address this question. And um, I, I'm not in a position to answer it in great regulatory detail. But um, first of all, I think that social inequality has to be addressed from several different positions. I think we get more exposure to the idea of urban poverty in this country, and we have less of a sense of rural poverty. And it is something that's a problem. You have communities in these states in, in the South and in the Midwest where the schools are underfunded, where nobody's paying attention to their information systems. They're basically abandoned, and I think we're getting some blowback from that. And just because their communities can't support news organizations uh, doesn't mean that we can afford for them to go without quality news. We will pay a price nationally for this. So I think that if there's an administration that honors such issues, this is something that needs to be on the agenda. Uh, again, if you look at the red states and the swing states, these are states that we're going to determine this, the, the, the future for all of them. So we can't just ignore them. Um, we have to, I, I, I really subscribe to Victor Picard's argument in his book, Democracy Without Journalism, that we should treat information as a public good. So if everybody is guaranteed or should be guaranteed by the state access to clean air and clean water, then we should be guaranteed access to facts within our usual environment. And the business model for that is open for discussion. Victor Picard says it has to have a public funding model for the time being. I think he's probably right, but it needs to be thoroughly discussed and, and addressed. You need to look at your own media diet. I think the media bias chart that has been published, this is a recent update, is not perfect, but it's useful. It's a great start. And what, what I'm talking about in terms of Having a common ground for discussion public issues would be in the green space at the top. The organizations that, that may have different political perspectives, but they have a, a, an allegiance to fact-based reporting, to edited and, and corrected reporting um, that have a high degree of professionalism. And I think that ultimately, we've let the tech platforms um, have their way with us for 20 years, it's not working out so well. And I think that going back to the previous panel, it's a question of, of, of addressing a regulatory framework and saying, who are the people in the room where it happens? And it has to include civil society. It has to include people who know what professional journalism looks like. It has to include people who are representative of the underrepresented in our society. These interests have been kind of bulldozed by the tech industry. And uh, it has not served us well. And I also feel in the long term that the tech industry will not benefit by undermining the principles of democracy, because ultimately, a healthy economy depends on a healthy society. Here are some resources, um, some of the articles that will give you more information of the issues I discussed. And uh, Thank you very much, and I'm looking forward to your questions. Thank you. I'm I'm gonna I'm gonna clap and hope that it <laughs> there are echoes in the room. Um, that was that was absolutely phenomenal. Um, just the the level of detail, the data, your ability to kind of pull us back, but also bring us in um, uh, to really look at the the implications of the manipulation of these uh, platforms and these tools and um, uh, you know how how particular political interests are being used to are being used to weaponize um, or being weaponized against communities in our um, existing uh, democratic structures. So 
Um, so with that, um, I recognize that we've got 10 minutes until the next session. Um, I do want to open the floor for questions. Uh, I see Hillary, your hand is up. Jessica, I also see your hand is up. So we'll start with Hillary. We'll go to Jessica. And for anyone else that has questions, um, we are going to leave the room um, open if you do want to chat and you want to uh, hang back and, and speak to to and, um, and ask her your questions directly. But we are also going to be opening the room for the next um, panel, Art and Impact, uh, with uh, Jessica Silvey. So we'll start with Hillary, then we'll go to Jessica, and then anyone else, we'll keep an eye out for your hands. Uh, thank you so much, Anne, for this interesting and timely uh, talk and contribution to our conference. Um, so I, I uh, was teaching, so I wasn't in the regulatory uh, session, but um, uh, the what I'd like to ask about, it has to do with this last part of your talk uh, in which you mentioned a shift in a, a sort of regulatory attitude towards information as a public good, which evokes a kind of let's regulate this as a utility. Well, of course, we've done that before prior to, um, you know, the elimination. Oh, sorry. Can you not hear me? No, I can't. But I'll okay. Okay. I'll sorry about that. I'm at the university, so hopefully things work okay here. Um, but uh, right, so you had said, you know, let's treat information as a public good, as a regulatory frame shift. And it seems to me that that goes back historically to the kind of pre, uh, the, you know, the broadcast scarcity days in which high levels of regulation were justified by the fact that the spectrum was limited. And so therefore distributing broadcast licenses, right? We're talking about the fairness doctrine abandoned formally by the FCC um, in the last decade on justification that, um, that we kind of can have a robust marketplace of ideas to use Holmes's idea, uh, you know, notion within the law because we've got cable news and a proliferation of fora. In fact, in Citizens United, there's a strong um, sort of analytical line that talks about technology in which um, Justice Kennedy says, oh, the internet is going to solve this problem because there's, yes, there's the possibility of PACs buying lots of airtime, but the internet is going to balance that out to forgetting that people don't just have unlimited ability to process information, which is what makes Cambridge Analytica's targeting so useful, as you've said to us. Um, so I just wonder, a uh, question, um, Jessica has found in her work, at least so far as I understood from her Klein um, lecture, a shift from a kind of markets and money regulatory approach in IP law to an equality and dignity approach. So given that we have at least one example of that shift happening, how do we shift back given the reasoning around technology that eliminated broadcast regulation in the first place? Yeah, it's, it's, it, it's definitely thorny and, you know, it's, it's as though, you know, there was a framework that was developed for apples and it's suddenly applied to apple juice, you know. Um, it just doesn't fit into the same. And I think that we have to brainstorm in some really, really creative ways. So for example, I, I think a lot about uh, Food and Drug Administration regulation. So they don't prohibit people from creating poisonous substances, right? But there are different standards for marketing something, and there are things that have to be labeled in certain ways, and there are warnings that have to be <laughs> placed on them. There's an infinite uh, number of goods that can be produced. They can't all be marketed, and some of them have to be marketed with caution. So I would say you do have to walk away from the scarcity model. because it, it, it is obsolete. But I think that in some ways, the COVID misinformation gives us a really strong opportunity to rethink information because in this case we see how misinformation kills right in the same way that poisoned vitamins do right um and the other thing is guaranteeing you know it's like again going back to the nutritional model you can't force everybody not to drink poison water but you can guarantee that everyone has access to pure water and, and we're, not, we're not realizing that guarantee in our society on an equitable basis right now. And the other thing is to have it locally available, right? And, and you know, say, oh, you have access to it, but it's, you know, it's, it's either conceptually or geographically distant. So it's not necessarily of use to you. Like, you know, if, and I, I'm a real, real believer in local journalism. Um, 
So for example, my, my parents who are listening today um, live in Stillwater, Oklahoma. And what the Stillwater News Press does for people right now is tell them what the statistics are for the Payne County, Oklahoma on COVID today, right? There's nobody else around who's gonna do that. But they'll also tell you which bush is blocking the intersection causing an accident. And the New York Times isn't gonna tell them that either. And a lot of the national discussion about media tends to be dominated by coastal entities. And I've been in the room with New York Times editors saying, oh, the solution is for everyone to read the New York Times. Well, no, I don't agree with that. I think that hyper-local journalism is more important than ever. Really useful. Yeah. Um, it's, it's a, there's a, I mean, if we were thinking about values, Hillary, just to think about, there's a sustainability model, sort of a, 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 a human sustainability model in news, the way we might think about sustainability in food, for example, um, that um, Anne's talking about. So my question um, goes back to journalistic norms. Um, I've been sort of alarmed by the both sides-ism that I'm seeing a lot in, um, in mainstream media, like the New York Times and Washington Post. Like, you know, I saw today a fact checking of the town halls last night, both Trump and Biden being fact checked on their misinformation. And I thought those aren't equivalents. Like why? So I, I, I'm, I'm interested in your take on, on where that's coming from, how we understand it, why, how we might be able to reposition it as misguided. I think that, um, I, I, I'm concerned by it as well, and I think that there's just such a, a vivid example uh, where you know all of the attention, all of this, the real estate that was given to Hillary Clinton's emails, which was a non-story, and then the vindication of her use of emails as not being a national security risk was you know a paragraph on A18, right? Uh, and I think that when institutions feel that they're under attack, they react in a, in a defensive posture. And that's what I see happening. Uh, I think that as the ultra conservatives have taken over the Republican Party over the last 10 to 20 years, um, they, have, they have really launched an assault on, on, on major media organizations that is culminating now. So you have them somewhat bending over backwards to prove they're not liberal, right? And I think that's part of the issue you're talking about. But you can't underestimate the economic battering that they've been taking. So they're trying to create this, this space for themselves, and I don't think that they've managed it terribly well. Uh, and, and the other thing is that they haven't, they haven't located themselves within the new media landscape so for example, if, if you've got this stream of, of media coming out about Trump because he's so good at capturing attention, they don't know how to navigate that. He, he demands attention and they give it to him. And, being, and, and I think the other part of the problem is that Democrats tend to come from a legalistic policy background and talk like policy wonks and they don't play in the same way. You see it time and time again, what you find in Trump, and the reason why he's been so effective as a vehicle is his reality television mentality. So he has not, uh, he has not won over the majority of the voters, but he has known how to speak to these slices of voters in battleground states that the Democrats have neglected. Thank you so much. That was a great answer. Um, I, I wish we could continue this conversation for the rest of the afternoon, but I do know that um, we do have another uh, panel. So thank you, Anne. I just want to give you, you. Thank you. applause. Thank you so much for that. Um, you shared a, a number of resources that we're also going to share with everyone um, uh, at the end of the conference. Um, but we are also going to hang, I'm going to hang back for another 10 minutes, but in the chat, you'll see a link to the next panel, um, our final panel of the day, looking at art, technology, and democracy with uh, Jessica. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, Tony.